Thank you for sending that out. Please reopen it. Okay. All right. By now, we pretty much all know Patty Michelle Schaefer, our presenter today. Uh, rocket engines, combustion, and the straight sights, climatic impact, climat climate impacts to our towns. Now, Patty Michelle is a rocket scientist, retired, putting in many years at the aerospace, co aerospace company and the U.S. Air Force. A launch center, rocket uh, space, and space, and space and missile system center in LA. And now she lives among us here in the Prescott area. And I would say she's the premier public intellectual of our of our area. She's a real asset and I wish to take her out. And she's demonstrating on her own property uh, some easy do-it-yourself adaptation to the, the climate change, like painting her roof white. And maybe uh, Patty will tell us a little bit more about the comparison. In, uh, it's sort of like a, a, a layer of, of insulation, you know, the albedo off of the roof. And uh, planting an edible garden, fruit trees and such uh, on her property. So. Oh, and also supplementing her connection to the grid with uh, solar and putting up sunshades. I mean, it, it's just a textbook demonstration of how each of us can uh, can do a, our own uh, do-it-yourself uh, adaptation. And furthermore, Patty is a stalwart at our Friday afternoon peace vigil, the Grand Minister of Peace, every Friday here on the Yapa uh, County Courthouse Square. So she'll talk to us about adaptation, transformation, and equity and the addressing the angst within this current ish gulf. Take it away, Patty Michelle. So there's a lot of weird things going on, like Elon Musk is plan. Did, did he already send up a car into space? He was talking about doing that. That's a total waste. But what it does is it makes everybody think, gee, is this great? We're sending cars into space. There's no problem. <laughs> you know? But is an electric car? <laughs> unknown. I believe it was a Tesla. I mean, he's got money. He can do anything he wants to, and he can waste it which is one of the problems with there being so many rich and the rest of us poor, is that all that money represents wasted resources. So we need rich guys do that. But anyway, I'm going to talk about facts, which are these sorts of things, cell phones, radio. You've seen this before, maybe, uh, equations. This is gravity. This is electromagnetism uh, that governs radio waves and stuff like that. Internal combustion engines and the Navier-Stokes equation. Um, everyone may not know this, but I always say it. In 2003, oops, no, 
there was the Acri versus New World communication decision, which set a legal precedent saying it's legal for the US news to not tell the truth, to lie, basically. So that's a legal precedent. Yeah, it's weird, isn't it? But Canada has the Radio Protection Act. They say the news must tell the truth. So as a result, the US news can't broadcast legally in Canada. Um, so that's just telling you how weird our world is. I mean, we all laugh, haha, the news doesn't tell the truth, but it's legally not required to. Well, so you, it goes further back than that. In 1986, Ronald Reagan rescinded the tariff doctrine, which meant that news stations did not have to tell the truth. And one year later, Fox News was in business. Right, but this is legal now. This is okay. law. Um, so de demonstrations, this is always the fun part. Gravity is easy to demonstrate. And when I say facts, like I've had people come up to me and say, oh, that's a scientific theory, it's not a fact. <laughs> well, no, wait a minute. There are things we absolutely know. Now, if I let go of this piece of steel, we absolutely know what's going to happen. There's nothing you can do to stop that. That can't be stopped. So I show that thing to people. Another demonstration I do is electromagnetism, which is that guy. Interestingly enough, that look, that's called a partial differential equation. This part here says, that part there just says the curl of the electric field. What that means is the electric field will curl around something, like a tornado. This other part here means how fast the magnetic field changes, which is fairly straightforward. So I put a bunch of wires around here. There's no batteries or anything. So now if an electric field curls parallel to these wires, it's going to make a current that will light the little light bulb. But how would I put? current into there. Well, I'd have to put a curling electric field. But I can do that by just putting a magnet in there quickly. Because how quickly the magnetism changes tells me how big the curl is. That's what an equation means. So again, just demonstrating facts. I've got a, a horseshoe magnet here. A pretty strong one. Yeah. So, um, if I put this into that horseshoe magnet, all of a sudden there will be a sudden increase in the magnetic field, and that means there will be a curl in the electric field in these wires. You should see the, the light bulb light up, which indeed you do as you go in and out. So there's no way you could do this without that working. So this is, again, just a fact. These are the kind of things I bring up to uh, folks who want to discuss things like climate change and so forth. This is a new one I wanted to try. A little more light, Patty? Yeah, a little bit. Thank you. Maybe you could just flick on the lights, it'd be easier. strong magnet. <laughs> and as you might expect, a magnet doesn't do anything to wood, right? No. It just slides down like a piece of metal. This is just a piece of metal. No magnetism here at all. Well, it'll get attracted to that, but these aren't magnetic. So, and also the metal. And this is just aluminum, so it's non-magnetic. But this conducts electricity, unlike a piece of wood. So if I slide this down the uh, piece of wood, it doesn't do anything because it's not conductive. Whereas this conducts. So when this moves, it's going to make a curl electric field. How do you like that? And in fact, it's not magnetic, you can see. But what it's doing is, as it moves, it's creating a curling electric field. And that curling electric field then creates a magnetic field, but in the opposite direction. So it pushes against this one's magnetic field. That's how magnetic brakes work. So 
draw a lot of a magnetic field in that circumstance will continue to build up per the length that it's going down the aluminum? It, it tapers off as it goes in. That's called a skin effect. That's a good observation, though. And the faster it goes, the stronger. So if you move slowly, you don't feel much. But the faster you go, it can actually move the thing around. But here's a fun little demonstration. I have two different magnets. They're pretty strong, so there's a spacer. One magnet is stronger than the other. Can you tell which one is stronger? Well, I'm guessing it's the one that's in your head. <laughs> that's right. Because it makes a stronger current, uh -huh. circulating current, that then pushes back harder on this one. Yeah. So these are just scientific facts. There's no mystery or magic here. But things like that are what govern climate change. That's why we know climate change is happening. Due to magnetism? No, not due to magnetism, but um, see all these equations? Magnetism is one of them, which is that. And I demonstrated gravity. You can demonstrate this for yourself by stepping off the roof if you don't. But this is the Arrhenius equation. These are the Navier-Stokes equations. And I'm going to talk about those in just so I was, I was featured on uh, the BBC. This is my interdisciplinary background. Probably not kind of boring, but this is one of the things. That I did this for the, for the uh, NASA, and this is what was featured on the BBC. A, um, this was now a tank that would be on orbit. But instead of being on orbit, it's sitting in a vacuum chamber. And we fired a uh, projectile at it. Projectiles going at orbital velocity, seven kilometers per second, and just there's no explosives. That's just due to the velocity of that particle, and it creates all this chemistry and so forth. That's what these colors are: it is metal um, reacting of the various metals in there. So that was a new discovery. But this is now more related to climate change. Here's the Navier-Stokes equation, but in a computer. There's all these grids in the memory of the computer. And each one of these little triangular cells, this is a slice through that. You solve the Napier Stokes equations, like I sort of solved over there. And it creates a model that allows you to model the chemistry. This is a rocket at Mach 3. You can't follow it and sample the chemistry, but we can model it in that computer, much the same way that we model the planet Earth for climate change, and that's the connection there. Because climate models use these Navier-Stokes equations and so forth. But this is the temperature of the rocket plume. It's flying at about Mach 3.5. These are the number of electrons in the rocket plume. And this is the mole fraction of the OH negative radical. So we can actually do a lot with our models that we can't do easily in the real world, including model the planet. This was kind of fun to show. This is my rocket engine. And this brown layer here is unburned fuel that's used to cool the inside of the combustion chamber. And it ignites and makes the plume fatter. But if you turn off the oxygen, this is just kerosene burning out. And this stuff up here, black sooty smoke, is all what's called PM 2.5. This is actually illegal to release in the United States because what happens is there's not enough oxygen to make this burn clean. You know, you, and so what happens is the kerosene reacts with itself and builds larger and larger molecules until it eventually gets up to soot size. And these are soot particles. But they're all coated with carcinogens because this stuff here is carcinogenic. So that's why PM 2.5 diesel soot is illegal. Um, now they make it, the EPA says you can only, if you release more than a certain amount, then you have to then it's illegal. So a single car can't release enough to trigger a federal law. But state laws, like California, if you drive a truck releasing sooty plumes, they'll pull you over because they have state laws. Here in California, or uh, Arizona, we don't, right? You see sooty trucks out there all the time. But this is what they're releasing, is PM 2.5. Question. Yeah? So you check the level of uh, carbon emissions testing through the vehicle and more people? I don't know. What do you guys think about?
about that. Well, I think if Californians will hear it uh, as they are, I think we will. I think we will see How long? it politically. How long? Within 10 years. Can, can I uh, suggest, I'm not sure, but I think in Pima County and Maricopa County, they are more strict. It's just up here yeah. that we don't have the population. Why, why well, is it? They've got the brown cloud down there. We don't have a brown cloud up here. That's okay. We may start to have that out in the valleys because a couple of times on the radio when you've had these fires, yeah. um, people had their asthma triggered because it's the, the smoke from the fire settles down into like uh, Camp Verde, that valley over there. And then also in our area. Yeah. What what people? I drove there once last year and I couldn't breathe. <laughs> there you are. So I mean I it would be it's heartening for me to hear what you say, Bill, because um, what I see here is sort of a culture of your I shouldn't say that. No, right. no be mean. Well No, I'm not gonna be mean. One of the things <laughs> I gain from getting signatures on petitions is I get people saying, oh, I just moved here from Utah. Okay, well, or I just moved here from California, or I just moved here from Oregon. And most of the people that came from moving here are from blue states. So I, this state is currently purple, but I think it'll be blue in 10 years. Yeah, well, 10 years, but I understand, but, well, I guess, the Democrats would not be shutting down the Environmental Protection Agency. But it's not clear to me how the politics is actually going to play out in the future. Does anybody recognize this? Satter? Satter? Yeah, see? That's all PM 2.5 that then ignites, because it's extremely hot. When it hits the air, it ignites. So that's why that's so bright, because it's burning outside the rocket engine. Now this is happening in Texas, where I guess they have problems with pollution. This is all PM 2.5. This stuff that evaporates is steam. And they release it four miles from McGregor High School, but no one pays any attention. <laughs> where is this? Um, it's McGregor, Texas. That's the Elon Musk SpaceX rocket test site. Apparently Texas is drawing a lot of industry into itself because they're promising not to prosecute illegal releases like this. Hey, you know, Penny, um, we lived in um, Sun City for a while, and there were 25 sand and gravel mines um, throughout that area, and PM 2.5 was something that they people talked about all the time, and then PM 10, I think, was the other one. And, um, Often we, we kind of called them the purple people you know, uh -huh. because they were, people were really suffering just from living in Tampa. We left mm. that area. Oh, that and um, there was like nothing we, we could do about that. Yeah, and you know, that's an interesting point. Terrible. We have the most power in our lives in local politics, not yeah. less in state, yeah. even less in federal. So it's important to remember that as we prepare for a difficult future. But I'll mention that later. Arizona is a more powerful state than it used to be. Politically. That may not be saying much. Well, but it's, it, it, it's a result of states' rights. And as state, states are getting back power that the federal government used to think it was theirs. So. What they seem to be doing is opening mines and so forth. Well, uh, we've got the resources and uh, that's probably going to get money. Uh, so um, this is that PM 2.5 being dumped in orbit. So we have weather satellites and so forth that are being damaged by this guy also. You know, our government doesn't particularly care. It's not sure why, because they're going to have to replace those satellites or not. Um, this is a rocket I've tracked. So you can see it's white, the plume. But what happens, you take that and put it through a prism, and it spreads out the colors into their native colors. This is in the infrared, so it's all one color in there. And then down this axis is the distance down the plume. So you'll see the plume move, so you'll see this move. But look at the wavelengths here. So 
both wavelengths in that axis. But what happens here is, uh, why aren't you doing this? There we go. Okay. So this should be uniformly bright across here, but you can see these bands here are dark. Interestingly, the atmosphere is black at those wavelengths. So if you could only see at this wavelength, you wouldn't be able to see anything beyond like a foot because the atmosphere is black. And that's because of these trace gases, carbon dioxide and water in the atmosphere. They're that strong an absorber and they absorb sunlight and that's the origin of the greenhouse effect. So anybody who works on light knows the greenhouse effect is true. Now, why they don't say it, I imagine it's for political reasons. But scientists are people too. They want to be rich. They want to have many cars. They want to go on European vacations. So they spin the truth. So there's this problem that I've been encountering here of denial. And there are a couple of subtle forms of denial. Like there's one form of denial where you say, a lot of these guys say, oh, climate change is a democratic hoax or whatever. It's you deny the facts just for some reason, whatever your reason. And because of reason, I don't believe that. But there's also more subtle forms of denial that are used by scientists, not me. Uh, climate activists use these forms of denial. Politicians use these forms of denial and others. Interpretive denial is the first one. And that's, you reinterpret the fact into something less scary, mm. but something that's not based on facts. And then there's implicative denial, where you deny the implications of the fact. Like if you're 95, you're probably not going to do certain things that a 35-year-old would do, but you might believe next year you'll do them. And the implications of being 95 are specific. And we know that. Maybe I should say 105 so I don't have any pushback on that. Denial is also the first longest river in the world. Yeah. So we say, oh, that guy's on an Egyptian vacation. Cruising the banks of the Nile. So interpretive denial would be, oh, if I buy a Prius, it'll help solve climate change. But the problem is, all new cars release a lot of carbon. So it's actually not helping anything. But it makes you feel better. And that's probably why we do denial, so we'll feel better. Or being a vegan will solve climate change. And I'll show you why that's not true a little bit later. An example of implicative denial, oh, we can rely on a government or some party or some group in our existing society to fix climate change. But the implications of our current knowledge is that our government will likely collapse. Um, so Careful. You're, I know. And I forgot my Prozac. I'm sorry. I normally <laughs> now start handing out Prozac. Um, and you know what? There's only one party that's actually honoring the facts. It's the International Green Party. That's the only party that actually uses the facts in setting up policy. They're big in Europe, but they're nothing here. Oh, I just thought I'd say that. Not quite that big. Yeah. Party action. So how many people here know what the Holocene is? Yeah, I you. Got one. Okay, so right here, now this is time. Here, this is in tens of millions of years. This is in millions of years. This part is in hundreds of thousands of years. And this part is in tens of thousands of years. There's a line separating each one. So before about a million years ago, the Earth was too warm to have ice ages. There weren't any. Ice ages started about a million years ago. And that's what these are, in and out of ice ages. That's, those are called Milankovitch cycles, and it's because the Earth has a tilt and it wobbles. So sometimes it's in a position that it collects more energy, so it becomes hot. Other times it's in a position where it collects less energy. Actually, it's not the wobble, I'm sorry. It's the eccentricity of the orbit. Uh, Daddy, excuse me, did you say the, la the last ice age was about a million years ago? No, that's when ice ages began. There were no ice ages beforehand. The Earth was too hot for ice ages. Even Antarctica. Ice age is when uh, uh, the Earth gets cold enough.
enough that a large fraction of it is covered by glacier. Oh. I didn't say there was no ice on there. Oh, okay, all right. Actually, all right, I don't know enough about plate tectonics to say much more than that. So if we look at just this side here, this is the last 20,000 years. So right here, our genus appeared in the fossil record. This is about the time that creatures like us separated from gorillas and chimpanzees and apes and so forth. So there was Homo heidelbergensis, Homo neanderthalis, the neanderthal. Uh, there was uh, several other species that existed all throughout these millions of years. But then about 200,000 years ago, our species appeared. I mean, from the skulls, you know, they could tell they were like us, human type skulls, not Neanderthals or something like that. But they still weren't quite like us because they didn't think like us. Right about here is where we really appeared. Um, and there are people like us who talk, who make jokes, who wear jewelry, wear fancy clothes, who want to acquire things. That's when we appeared. But the climate was still a mess. We were still having ice ages and so forth. Then something remarkable happened right here about 11,000 years ago, the climate stabilized. And all of a sudden, we have this constant climate for the last 10,000 years or so. And the way we respond, that's called the Holocene, that last little 10,000 year period. So nobody really cares about this in terms of us. What we care about is this, because what happened is, all of a sudden, there's growing seasons. Whereas back here, there were no growing seasons. The earth was flipping around, crazy temperatures. So if there's growing seasons, you can plant wheat. And grain-based agriculture began in the agricultural revolution. Another five or 10,000 years, we began having civilization, like um, the Egyptians, the Ionians, the Greeks, the Bronze Age. So this was the age of civilization. Why? Because they could feed themselves predictably all year round because you can store grain. Mm. Now, the Mesoamericans had potatoes. They made chuño, I understand. They would dehydrate potatoes and store that. And wild teosinte grass was turned into corn, or maize, actually, uh, by, I believe, the Central Americans and the North American Indians, natives. Um, but in the around the Mediterranean, it was grain. And in Asia, it was rice. But so we really, really care about this Holocene because our civilization depends on grain. The problem is global warming. And this is where we're expecting to be by 2050 and 2100. And you can see that's way back here where ice ages aren't even allowed. And it's so hot that things are very different. Um, and that's a concern because we could lose everything that we're accustomed to. So that's a rationale for why glaciers are Oh yeah, sure. Yeah, in fact, uh, they're receding much faster than expected, and I'll talk about that a little bit. So our problem is heat, and this popped up there. Earth will soon be too hot for reliable food production. Already, uh, they're growing uh, um, um, olives and Mediterranean and champagne in Great Britain, of all places because it's gotten warmer there, and now it's too hot. Italy's struggling with heat. Um, the Champagne region is having trouble having enough time for their grapes to grow before it gets too hot. So the climate is definitely changing, and heat is the issue. So here's an example. So these are all thermometer readings in North America. You know, the United States and other countries have thermometers all over the place that their weather services use. So if you collect all those millions of readings, plot them on the graph, we get this, um, where there's this is more frequent. So there's very few readings here, tons of readings in this area, and very few readings here. Over 51, 1951 to 1980, I was born in 54, so this includes my birthday. Over here is extremely cold, over here is extremely hot. So there are almost no extremely hot days and no extremely cold days. But look what happens. That's the average temperature. That mathematically, that would be defined as the average temperature. How do you define extremely hot? Um, to 
two sigma above the average? Yeah, like uh, one day every five years would be an extremely hot day. But you can see there's not a line here, okay? And these are millions of readings. So there's probably things down there. You just can't see them on this plot. So watch here as this plays. It's an animation. There's 83 through 93, 94 through 04, 05 through 2015. So these are the heat waves that we've been hearing. Tens of thousands of people dying throughout the world in Europe, in Russia. And green, uh, crops failing. We've had several partial crop failures in the United States. This year, there was a lot of rain in the corn region, I understand, because I have friends who grow corn. Yeah. And uh, they showed just nothing growing. So it's not just heat. But the reason I bring up heat is because, well, it's kind of dramatic and kind of relevant to Arizona. So this is 2016. I did have a slide from 2018, but I couldn't find it. So Canada had the Fort McMurray fire. We now are used to days when planes can't take off because it's too hot and they weren't designed to fly in that heat of air. Um, Great Britain, railroad, uh, railroads buckling because the steel expands outside of its design tolerances. So I understand some Scandinavian countries are now painting their rails white to avoid that because this year, actually it was 18, they were having wildfires in Siberia, wildfires in the Arctic, uh, wildfires in Japan that doesn't have wildfires, wildfires in Great Britain. None of these countries deal with that, but now they do because of that extremely hot day that I was showing. That's why I showed that. How do you talk to people when they're in denial? Isn't that what we're getting at? Um, not with this, I'm just, that would be a good topic. Um, I'm not sure that anyone knows how to do that. One of the reasons I come here is, uh, well, for instance, what I do is when I talk to people, um, I will just say a fact or a truth. And you might not be able to convince them, but you started something. And I do want to ask a question relevant to that, and I'll get there in a minute. So this is another reason I bring up heat. This was just released, 2019, by the Union of Convert Concerned Scientists. Um, so they have now a website that has all this data on it that civil planners, like Prescott, civil planner, could use to plan for the future. So this is the way things used to be. And now this is 105 degrees. Now that's heat index, not temperature. Um, heat index takes into account temperature and relative humidity. So if you can't sweat enough to cool off, then the heat just kills you. So this is basically really bad. It used to really only be a problem right down here near the border. But in the, com in the coming years, that's going to happen more and more throughout the country. And right here, I think this is the Yavapai County right there. The, no. Oh, right, that's the United States. Yes, you're right. You're right. Yeah. And so I'm colorblind. So that's this color? Yeah. Uh, yeah. So we have tens of days per year where if you're trapped outside, you can die. You know, like if your car breaks down and you're walking or if you're the grid goes down and your air conditioner stops working. So that's going to put a load on our uh, you know, medical system locally. Our, med our electrical generation system too. Right, and that's a concern because heat damages generators. And if a expensive generator blows, you can be down for weeks. And this has happened in the United States in these hot areas. And this one was also in the report, rising heat stroke in the military. Um, well, yeah, um, I was out at Edwards Air Force Base taking data, and I, it was like that rocket engine I showed you. It's some really cool data, but it's not in here. And um, I guess they have to have air conditioning in the jets because they can just die. Because yeah. they're in an oven, and they have a flight suit on and a helmet. So um, 
because they have to sit and wait for the jet to take off, and they're doing training out there. And they were also under flight restrictions because there's not enough jet fuel. So, you know, they're, they're restricting, and that was eight years ago. Um, this is recently, there's more, many more record high days than there are record low days, whereas they used to about balance out. So this is taking off fast. So it's gonna be in our generation that we see a lot of these effects. So we need to know about them at least. And that would be the, the goal of being here. Here's another paper. This is from uh, uh, Science Advances. And right in there is Yavapai County uh, soil moisture over the next um, few decades. So we're probably gonna lose the rest of our pine trees. Um, this is now historically, this is going back to around 11, 1200 AD, thereabouts. These are the two uh, droughts that took out the Anasazi. This is where we are and where we're going. Where did, where did the Anasazi droughts? There were a couple of big ones there. But this is soil moisture now. So it doesn't always cor correlate to drought. But you can have in the, well, in the old days, they didn't have grain silos. So, and they didn't have wells. So a drought meant something different than what it means to us. But what it means is our, we've definitely got a problem with the wells. I actually presented this to the city council, but I doubt they care. You did? Yes. What did you do with this? Um, at one of the public things before they started restricting your rights of speak. Oh, what happened? Greg, Greg made, made the rails or you were there. Yeah, I presented this to them. Yeah, and that's pretty typical and I'll mention more about that. So I did some actual calculations. I used the National Center for Atmospheric Research, which is called NCAR, the national weather model they do to model all our national weather. And I took the climate, behind here is the climate data, and then you get it down to very fine data so you resolve the mountains and the valleys because they have a big effect on local weather. And then I ran predictions out for the rest of the century. This is the 2030s. Here's a couple of really serious rain events where we get five to 10 inches of rain in a few days or less. That could cause a lot of damage. Yeah, sure could. Um, here's now 65 to 67, 2065 to 2067, another extreme event, but also decreased rainfall. What this is is total precipitation, and this is months, starting with a year after the first, the first month First year is out here and I don't look at that, so 13 would be January. And here's some extreme rain events. This is total accumulated precipitation. But this year right here is less than half the rainfall we normally get. Now here's two lean years of no rainfall, uh, 27, 73 to 75. Now that sounds a long way out, but that's because this data comes from our best data so far which is this IPCC AR5 data in 2014. Now since then, there's been no new data because it takes years to come up with this data. So I'm waiting for the next data to come out and it's gonna be much worse. What we're observing is that things are going very rapidly. The Arctic, I don't know if you guys are aware that the Arctic is melting. Yes. So this is what our models, all the stuff I showed you about rainfall, that all comes from these models. But the real world is much worse. So when I was saying 2075, think 2040, because things are going much faster than the models. So in a couple of years, we'll have better information. Here's the Arctic mass by, come on in, have a start. Sorry. Sorry, come on in, there's plenty more to go, have a seat. The, um, <laughs> Oh, there is, yeah, a couple of seats. That's okay. So this is from Piomass, the Arctic Sea volume. So each year is around the outside, all the way up to 2019. Um, and then the distance outward is the volume of ice. And these colors correspond to the months. What people look at is September, the end of the uh, summer. And the ice is mostly melted. And you can see it's spiraling in very quickly. Um, should be gone within five years. 
And the problem with that is the models don't predict it. The models say it's going to stay there till 2100. So we know the models underpredict the problems we're going to see. And that's why I showed that. Did you just say that the Arctic ice was going to totally disappear? In the summer. In the summer. Right. We don't know how long before it totally disappears because it's nonlinear. Once you have a full ocean and no more ice, all of a sudden it can absorb a ton of energy. So it may change completely and we may never have ice again. That's how nature works. Well, or it may freeze over in the winter with just a little bit of ice. We don't know. And the models obviously are so bad they can't tell us what we need to know. We're just going to have to live further. So why is all this happening? I'm sure you know, carbon dioxide. What I just say is our carbon emissions. What this is is gigatons per year, and this is years. And this is increasing emissions. So if you want to know how many gigatons of carbon were released in, say, the year 2000, or let's pick 2012. You follow the line, and then you go over here, and you see that about 37 gigatons were released that year. Way back in 1980, it was below 20 gigatons. So the rate of release of carbon is increasing. It has been increasing. And the climate only cares about carbon. That's the only thing it cares about. It doesn't care about political parties. It doesn't care about dates. It doesn't care about um, whether you have a Prius or not. It only cares about the amount of carbon that's being emitted. And this is where the free market is taking us, to where we're releasing so much carbon that it's just a runaway hothouse climate. Is this a model specific to the United States, or is this the world? This is the world. And this isn't a model. This is actual data. That was the uh, 08 market crash, remember? Uh -huh. And that's the only time emissions actually went down. So we recently had a good old-fashioned recession, right? We need a lot more than that. <laughs> but I'm not going to say. Okay, so, um, so this red line is where our emissions need to go if we're going to avoid a catastrophe. And this is where the free market is taking us. I'm just curious. Does anybody want to go on the red line? Thank you. Right. There's one, two, three, four, five. Not a hard question to answer. Well, there's a lot that's buried in it because we're not doing it. So this is what I did. Uh, here was my carbon. This is the country average carbon footprint. It's a great graphic. Okay. So I retired. You had a high arch. Yeah. So I retired, it's not my foot. So I retired and got my carbon footprint down to here. I've installed solar cells and things like that. Um, I eat low on the food chain, uh, collect my own water. But this is where we need to be, all of us. What are some of the Ignore parameters? Ignore offsetting. What are some of the parameters for getting there? Individually. Individually. It's a trick question. There's really only one parameter that matters, and I'll show it to you in a minute. I heard somebody take a breath. Okay, so here's where our emit carbon emissions come from. I'm sorry, this is a real complicated, so the type is real small. This is called a Sankey diagram. Um, this says transportation, 13.5%. Uh, electricity and heat, 24%. Fuel combustion, 9%. Industry, 10%. Down here is land use change, like the burning Amazon, 18%. Uh, Agriculture, 13%. But this is for the whole world now. And what it's doing is, these are the various sectors. And waste is on the bottom. Right. Um, Just a little? Yeah. Okay. And these are the things we do, and what comes out are these greenhouse gases. So that's a really complicated diagram, but for instance, you could follow a line here from electricity and heat, and you follow it down to where it's used in agricultural energy. And so it tells you a lot. These are really hard to make. And then you follow it into carbon dioxide. 
Or if you wanted to know about HFCs, like refrigerants, you could follow it up here, some other industry, a manufacturer of HFCs, and then they have two energy inputs. One is this red one here, and, uh, or was it here? And the other one is whatever color this is. So you can actually follow the flow from energy to carbon dioxide. And you made this up? No, no, no. The world is trying to save itself. There's a lot of very intelligent people working hard. It's a guy named Sanji. He's the guy who first came up with this concept. It's a growing concept because these are so complicated. See, this you can show to a lawmaker, and he'll get it without having to read a book. He can just look and see, oh, iron and steel industry is big in my area, and oh, we have that much carbon dioxide, and we use this energy, and we use that energy. So I can download this off the internet? Um, you can download almost everything off the internet. Here's for the US. The EPA has an awful lot of this stuff. Notice now it's huge in energy, almost no agriculture. Uh, what is that one? Industrial processes. Well, we don't have much industry in our country anymore. We've outsourced it all. And then down, is that waste? Yes. So um, transportation. So I was fighting with Debbie Cotton, trying to tell her, you know, she's talking about veganism. It's like, well, veganism, you know, food is almost nothing from our carbon dioxide stuff. What matters is those damn big trucks we drive. You know, things like that. Right. Yeah, but you've taken the even more off the street chain. Um, yeah, part of that is for health reasons. Yeah. Um, and in case you think I'm faking you out, this is actually 2019 from the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency. You can see over three quarters of everything is uh, industry, transportation, electricity. Agriculture is a little bit. So one gallon of gasoline or aviation fuel, if you're going to go flying on an airplane trip, is 20 pounds of carbon into the atmosphere. And that's carbon our kids and grandkids have to deal with. But we know even more. And this is where somebody was asking, I'm sorry, about something. So this is from Lucas Chancel and Thomas Piketty, two of the foremost um, climate-aware economists in the world. Basically, most of the climate activity is going on outside of the US. That's why Greta Thunberg came here. She didn't come from here, because as a nation, we're in denial. Um, but what's interesting is here's half, basically, of the world's carbon dioxide emissions come from 700 million people. That's basically 10% of the world's population. Um, another 3 billion, 3 billion now people release only about 40%, two fifths of the carbon dioxide in the world. And the 3.5 billion people release about 10%. So you could take those 3.5 billion people, put them on a rocket ship and shoot them into the sun and it wouldn't slow down carbon dioxide emissions at all. Hmm. Wouldn't slow down. So it's not a population problem. There are other things that are, but this is not. And this is the part that gets me. The way it works is you can see here, this ring tells you the European Union has 19% of this 45%. China has a pretty small amount, because they don't have a lot of wealthy people. They have a lot of very poor people, and they're growing wealthy people. But we have all the wealthy people. So over 20% of all emissions are just due to Americans. Carbon emissions are isomorphic to wealth. Um, isomorphic is a fancy way of saying the same as. And the reason is because if you're rich, you spend money, and you buy things. And when things are made, it releases carbon, like a new car. If you buy a new car every year, you're a big offender. If you fly to Europe several yeah. times a year, well, lots of carbon. That's the mantra of the Western capital of, of the world. Right, but only certain people can afford that. Half of all Americans are poor. Of course. No, there it is. This is from the uh, Social Security Administration. These are the 2015 statistics but they've been the same since uh, 
like 1990, 1985, right there, 51% earn less than $30,000. Those people are not buying new cars. They're not flying to Europe. So out of those 327 million people, less than half of those have much carbon footprint at all. So it's really us wealthy who are doing that. The more money you spend, the larger your carbon footprint. Climate change is a problem of affluence, not population. So when you get people like Elon Musk firing his rocket every day, several times a day, dumping carbon in the air. Now the people who work for him think it's cool because they get paid fairly well. So you've got this problem, even with scientists. I know many scientists. I've worked with about 400 scientists at the Air Force. What they love, their Mercedes Benz. Yeah. Their um, $120,000 job. My boss wore $300 shoes. You know. So scientists are human beings also. And this is the problem I have. You know, how do I live with these people? I'm sorry. Oh, OK, I'll wind this up. So what is, what does the physics say we must do? Very, very few people are responsible for most of the carbon. Probably less than 100,000, 100 million people in the world out of the 7.5 billion people are the ones who are causing climate change. And if we don't stop the emissions from those people, we'll probably have social or civilization collapse. So what does this suggest we do? Kill it all. That's funny, but how about something serious? Kellable. Uh -huh. Well, that would be you and me, too. Huh? Um, uh, I've been the top 10% is money. about $90,000. Wow. Um, net worth. I don't fit in that. That's not annual, that's net worth. Oh. Yeah, I fit into that. We're the ones doing it. So of course, much. the richer people are doing it more. Right. That's a problem I have with Prescott Indivisible, and I probably shouldn't say this. And I'd be standing there, and they'd come back, and they'd be talking about the European vacations. And I'm like, do you know how hard carbon that is? I mean, do you actually care about the future? And then people would tell me how much they make. This one guy was saying they own a bunch of land, and they have these renters. Is anyone here renting? Interesting. How many hands are there? Almost all of them. So, do you know who Greta Thunberg is? Yep. Yep. Everybody know? You don't know who she is? So she's a young Swede who uh, is traveling around the world, and she has access, due to her character, to the very highest level scientists on the planet. And they're trying to support her with facts so that when she talks to th people, she can say the truth. And that's been interesting. But stop using carbon. We have to do that. Stop pretending to be doing the right thing. But here's one. And this, I'd like people to, to hear what people say about this. What are we really asking our governments to do? Like, what would you want your government to do if, if we have to cut down our carbon emissions and we're the ones who are doing it? Cut military spending. Find a new energy source that doesn't produce carbon. There are no cheap energy sources. That's right. Well, I wasn't talking about cheap. I was talking about carbon. Well, I used the word cheap, but I didn't want to get elaborate or to. Yeah, that, that, that's not going to happen. Excuse there, me. There's only one thing, and I probably didn't do that very well. That wasn't. There's no. really only one thing we can do, and burn this into your mind. This is the only thing that's going to save us. Yeah. So I, I've had ideas like making car ownership uh, a thing of the past. And if you need to use something temporarily, rent one. Just have rental. Do you understand what this plot means? Sure. What that means is our carbon has to go to zero very quickly. And that means our spending basically has to go to zero. Can you explain why we should ignore that uh, offset 
that was on one of those charts? Yeah, I can do that. Don't let me forget. So, there's really no way around that. I mean, I'm going to talk a little bit about techno-optimism. There are people, scientists, who are basically lying, but it's kind of a gentle lie. It's more like cheerleading uh, for a losing team. Um, and, and that's a good thing. We have lots of cheerleaders on losing teams, but in this case, the losing team is our civilization. So it might not be such a good idea. But this, this is known to be the only way. In fact, you know, the IPCC, any of the reports you look at, they say, if we don't do this, it's done for. Unless you're listening to a cheerleader. So we're not going to find a zero carbon source. It's just not going to happen. Uh, I can. Well, anyway, this is what I was saying. What are we really asking our governments to do in order to follow that red line? That's what I should have said. Well, the line with the top card, as I said, find a, a new energy source that doesn't produce carbon. That's like saying move to Mars. Yeah. You shake your head when I say cut military spending. I didn't shake my head. No, I think you want to point out the gravity of the situation to that vehicle. So the government should open its ears to the fact that we're in this. They should stop denying. Those that represent us should stop denying and start getting rid of all the other arguments we're having around the globe about who's in Chechnya, who's in, who's there, who's doing this, and get down to the real fact. And I wrote cinema on that. I said, cinema, we elected you as a socialist to do these things in the environment. If you don't do it, we're gonna get someone else. Make it clear that we're serious. Be active every day like, like we are. And he, She's not a socialist. Actually, on the right side of the fence, just barely. Yeah. Anybody well, else have any ideas? Well, well besides the uh, stop spending, military spending. Um, well, from a How about <coughs> rationing carbon? You mentioned that <coughs> once in conversation. Anyone else? But how does carbon actually work? Rationing. Well, there's a lot of different ways that it works. There's sham ways and then there's real ways, right. uh, depending on who's talking. Um, even scientists lie, as I pointed out, although I call it cheerleading. Um, but for instance, if you have kids and you can just barely afford to keep your house warm enough to keep them from, it's called fuel, fuel poverty, to keep them from having asthma, and then the person 10 blocks over uh, has so much money that he flies to Europe routinely, then a carbon tax would affect those two people very, very, very differently. A simple carbon tax, I should say. And it's called demand inelasticity. The rich person, even if you double the airline ticket, he just buys it and then flies. Whereas a poor person can't. So it, it depends on how it's implemented. So it would be like a tax. I don't know what you mean. No, well, for instance, in the old days, they had graduated. They would, you know, it went all the way up to 70%. If you were a millionaire, you got income taxed at a very high rate, whereas if you're a poor person, the rate is much lower. So we've done that in the past. So how are the Europeans doing that? I think they're doing a better job of it. Uh, actually, I understand the uh, Europeans are waffling, especially the British, pretty hard right now. They want to expand Heathrow Airport and start fracking and things like that, uh, which is just releasing more carbon in the air. But I think Harry Aksha mentioned rationing. There's rationing over there. Is that what we're asking our government to do? Because we've got to get on that red line if we want to survive. Well, so if we're not going to get on the red line by ourselves, it strikes me that what we're asking the government to do is to force us onto the red line. Yeah. So how would you like to see that? Carbon rationing? How about martial law? No. 
I'm uh, just saying, you know, if, if we're talking nobody cooperating and the government has to save us from ourselves, it might come to martial law. But that's not a solution. That's a, a response, but it's not a solution. Agreed. It's an approach. I don't know if anyone who actually knows of a solution. I'm just sort of tossing out there that, yeah, martial law might be a problem. <laughs> Well, I, think, I think we have to speak up uh, every day against the fantasies. Like when I worked in the 80s in Maricopa cotton production in the, lab, in the labs, they were trying to get plants to grow efficiently during hot weather, you know, the expected increase in temperature. That, to me, is the wrong, we've got to stop wasting our energy in the wrong direction. The direction has to be hardcore. And then how's the government going to do that? We've got to, do you know my, any my way, my way of doing it is to get, to get on the right path, we have to start eliminating our way of life that is centered around consumption, like you were bringing up. And uh, I guess in a social, spiritual way, you gotta start making people happy without consuming. In other words, love your brother. But how is our government going to do that, was the question. Carbon rationing sounds like a, a good first step. I think also uh, I agree with you, but I'm sorry. encouraging agriculture to be more efficient uh, going indoors. I think it was Jim Bendel or maybe Rupert Reed talking about a greenhouse agriculture, you know, to prevent so much evaporation and to be, be able to control the climate better with under glass, under membrane. But more than half of our government is in denial, and it's not clear to me that Obama would have done any of this. No, he didn't do it. Well, he didn't have he didn't have quite the power of the Senate and the Congress to do it. True. Do you think any further he candidates did. will have that power? When we win the White House in 2018, our 2020, and we take over the Senate and we take over the House, there's going to be some motion in that direction. So that's faith. Huh? That's faith. Well, <laughs> no, I think we would have the power to do it politically. Right, but that we would win all of that. Well, the, the, the math is, is that the older generations are dying out, right. and the younger generations are more progressive. Right. Well, all the people I've met in the university and in their research laboratories and out on the street, some of my house guests, the younger people don't really care because they kind of know there's nothing they can do. Well, uh, the cool. kids in college, they want to be rich too, so they want to become like their professors and have Mercedes and so forth. So how are we going to get government to change attitudes? I don't know. I'm just tossing it out there. It's, it's a conversation we have to have for the next 50 years. Well, also, uh, the example of other governments, if, if we could uh, uh, follow some of these European and maybe uh, um, Nordic countries that are working to reduce our work within the carbon budget. Well, they don't have the same kind of lifestyle that we do. Yeah, they're very small emitters on that chancel picketing paper. I mean, we just have this massive country that, uh, and again, I point out it's the wealthy who are the elite. It's not the poor kid who can't afford to pay rent in this town. And I pondered, so, I pondered as best I could the thought processes that keep the elite moving in the direction that's causing the catastrophe. The thought processes that I've come up with talking to them, because I have Trump acquaintances that I talk to on these issues, is that they want to ensure that their offspring sure. inherit all the wealth that they have because they believe in a lifeboat mentality. That there's not a, there'll never be enough for everyone. And they keep their... Okay, I understand. But I want to remind you, they're doing some sort of denial thing in their head. Right. Where they're denying facts. 
they're denying the physics. They probably don't even know the facts, which is why I give these boring, disgusting talks. Is because uh, I want it's people it's to know it's about boring. the facts. It's not boring. So you know about these things, right? People may have seen the movie Merchants of Doubt, Naomi Klein. Uh, there's a new European uh, climate denialism that's taking hold. Um, more Naomi Klein. Uh, Chris Hedges was a reporter during the uh, Balkan Wars. Uh, the End of Literacy and the Triumph of Spectacle. That's written in response to Trump and that whole business. Um, the Green New Deal even is coming under fire because it supports the elite. And then there's scientific denial. Here's a group of scientists who claim they can suck the carbon out of the atmosphere when all the physics says that basically impossible. Um, and they've built this thing, but what they're actually marketing, and they're nice guys, I'm sure, and they all want to have their fancy car and their high paying job, because that's why you go to school, in order to have a higher paying job. Um, yeah. They sell this thing, which will make carbon dioxide for soda machines, or, I mean, it's got nothing to do with drawing down the climate, but this is capitalism for you. We're allowed to say whatever we want to do. Um, so here's the thing. We really have our most power here at home. We have really very little power in Europe or in Washington or even in the state capital. So we need to start looking locally, I think, and think about how do we make Prescott resilient for these coming catastrophes. Resilience, I don't know if you know, is basically like if a forest <coughs> burns and regrows to be a forest with the same animals and the same trees, then it's a resilient forest. If it burns and turns into a desert, there wasn't a resilient forest. It's the same way with communities. A community is defined by the people who live in it. A community is the people. If it struggles but survives, it's resilient. So that's what we would kind of like for Prescott. There's a couple of concepts here. We have to think about, if we're going to think about Prescott surviving, we have to remember always the four E's. We need energy. Energy to do the basic things. I mean, we use it like it's free now. Gasoline costs a few dollars a gallon, but that gallon will push your car 30 miles. Try pushing a car 30 miles. You couldn't do it with 100 people. So that's free energy. So as energy gets expensive, how do we decide where to use our limited energy? Equity is another thing. A stable society, meaning resilient, requires social equity. Everyone needs to be at the talking table when we decide what to do. Ecology, we need to have a functioning ecosystem. And economy, we need to have a functioning economy. So how do we create systems of local fair trade? How do we stop the damage to our local ecology? How do we create discussion forums for our community? Those are the kind of things we need to think about. But as far as I know, nobody's even thinking or talking about these. Well, isn't there the old adage of act locally, think globally? What does that mean to you, for instance? Well, do you, uh, uh, to follow on your, your concept that uh, well, we're, we're, we're more powerful here than we are anywhere else. So if you're going to act on something, act on something here. That sounds good to me. I think that's what I'm saying. Yeah. So um, this is from Jim Mandel. These things are summaries of information that global thinkers are working. This isn't my stuff. So this is from Jim Mandel and Rupert Reed. Um, Keep adaptation papers in 2018. So the first thing is the hard part, getting through the emotions of knowing disaster is on its way. And it doesn't look like we're going to stick to the red line. I didn't hear any really functional ways to get to that red line. Uh, no political party that has a chance of winning in the US has any plans on making the poor stop spending their money. That's just not going to happen. Um, but he talks about these things, resilience. How do we keep the values and things in this town that we really want to keep? But there's going to be serious problems and shortages of energy. So what things, behaviors, or beliefs do we let go of yeah. to keep things from getting worse? Yeah. One thing would be cars. Yeah. Yeah. 
um, restoration? What methods, mindsets can we bring back from the past to help us with coming difficulties and tragedies? Somebody here talked about, you know, the old days. We'd have a barn dance. We'd have a great time. It didn't require us to fly on airplanes to other countries to have a great time. I don't know. Maybe there are other things. But this is the approach for looking at how we prepare for that. And people need to be talking about this. Can we make reconciliation? Can we make peace between people, genders, generations? What about the uh, Native Americans? Do they have any wisdom left? Or have all their old wise people died off? Oh, I think they did get back. I don't know. I think they're trying as hard as they can. They better be. Yeah? Um, yeah, choose the direction, choose the leaders. Different, different leaders, different directions. Well, it's going to take a while to do that. So if we know disaster is coming in a decade or two, we better start now. And I'm not sure how. I, I think, I, I really don't know. I can't say. We should just pass this through. There's a lot of problems we could be facing. Here's a, here's a complicated idea I would explore. Turn all of the Indian reservations into a state on its own. That may be a federalist thing. Yeah. And we have but little then power. We, as a federal then we would get more environmentally conscious representation in Washington, D.C. But it's pretty um, unlikely to happen, I would say. Yeah. Uh, but, but we could have local politicians that would invite the elders mm -hmm. to their decision-making process. So that could happen if enough people said, I want that to happen. And they, because Mangarelli's kid worked over here at the Copper Top Ale House. I mean, you could go in and talk to them anytime you wanted to. So I mean, this is what a small town allows. So we have dangers. Nuclear war, didn't talk about that. Very likely now. Um, the grid goes down, we could have nuclear fires. We could lose government powers and protection if the US government starts really struggling. If something happens, like say the dollar loses its status as a world reserve currency, or China decides to sell off some of the bonds. I mean, things could happen that could cripple our government at the federal and maybe even the state level. We could have a bunch of states instead of a federal government. You just mentioned states' rights a while back. And we move back to California. There could, we may not be able to. If we have a totalitarian government, yeah. um, there could be rapid government rearrangement. Uh, there could be martial law. Uh, they may or may not favor the wealthy. Just like they did when Oklahoma had the dust bowl. Sure. The great collapse. Yeah. It's the same thing. Sure, and this is going to be like the dust bowl on steroids combined with the Great Depression probably in our lifetimes. If we take care of ourselves, Bill, and stop getting uh, bad infections. Uh, pneumonia? Again. Yeah, no more pneumonia. Um, but what comes to my mind is with the heat, there may be food, water, and shelter issues locally. How would we, at Prescott's already a good place. You know, AJ uh, will tell us, he says he'd never go hungry in Prescott. And that's way better than LA as far as I can tell. So, I mean, it's already a good place. How can we expand that um, with with our population growth? I don't know. I am not involved in that. Well, but it's something to think about and talk to I'm the people you, you know about. I'm glad you're bringing it up. Yeah. You might want to get involved in Seaway. Um, well, there's the Gary Beverly factor. <laughs> um, I call it BWAG for Beverly WAG. Well, he's, he's at home right now polishing his ego. So here's just my short list of things to do. It's my to-do list that I would suggest to each of you. Start talking a lot about everything I said here. Maybe you need to remind yourself, because this is a lot to take in. Make it polite and socially acceptable to clearly and meaningfully discuss the facts so that everybody doesn't say, oh, I'm a Republican, I don't believe in that. No, let's just talk facts. Uh, I'm going to ask a question. What's the difference between a rocket that shoots up a satellite into space and a rocket that propels a jet down here on Earth? 
propels a jet? Yeah, a jet airplane. Well, the only rockets I know are JATOs, Jet Assisted Takeoff. They're little big rockets that only fire for a few seconds to accelerate the jet really fast. So there's a difference between a jet rocket, as I'll call it, and oh, a the, rocket. Now, that would be a turbojet, mm -hmm. what you're thinking of. Oh. And that breathes mostly air. It burns very fuel lean. And it mostly accelerates the air, grabs the air in the front, and accelerates it out the back. Whereas a rocket doesn't ingest any air. Everything that gives it propulsion comes from tanks of liquid oxygen and liquid propellant. So you look at a rocket and it's all fossil fuel? Um, no, some are hydrogen. Uh, in fact, there's a, the, for instance, the space shuttle main engine was hydrogen, not fossil fuel. Okay. Um, that particular one I showed you on Musk was kerosene, which is a fossil fuel. Um, it's basically diesel fuel. Can I mention uh, this term, respectability politics? Uh, like during uh, the 60s, the civil rights marches, people wearing uh, their Sunday best and nonviolent response to, to the, the martial law that was coming at them with hoses and billy clubs and stuff. Respectability yeah. politics sounds like what you're talking about here, making it polite. Well, we are, we are headed in that direction. Which direction? Politeness. I, it strikes me that Prescott has a lot of potential there. Because when I first got here, I'd go to the city council meetings over the Deepwell Ranch. Uh, and there were people get real angry in there. And you'd see like the veins coming out on their neck. Or, and yet, they never swore at each other or anything like that. Yeah. So it struck me, wow, this town has a lot of self-respect or respect for each other. Um, so, but, I mean, this is only going to happen. But what I'm saying is, yeah, can we do that? Can we, like, um, who is the lady who was a Trumpy? She came over and said, how's Bill doing? While you oh. we were in the hospital. Yeah. And so there are deeper bonds yeah. between us than the divisive politics. But uh, can, can somehow talking about facts, and that's why I say facts, and that's why I give those demonstrations of just facts, can that be moved above and beyond the political discussion? Because I'm fine if the Republicans have a way to get us onto that red line. Mm -hmm. That's what we got to do. But yeah. as far as I can tell, they don't. In fact, most of the people you talk to don't even know about the red line. Yeah. And that may be the place to start. I ju uh, they just want to get to the end line with the most money. I don't know what's driving the demonstrators, yeah. but there are other people in this town. But for instance, here's a troubling thing. Um, so in The Guardian was a piece about um, the US invoking terrorist laws against the demonstrators trying to stop the pipeline. And the reason is because that pipeline has a huge carbon footprint. Okay. So that's why it has to stop. And yet the US is invoking almost martial law against these people. Because they can hold you without bail on these terrorism laws. Until the pipeline is finished. Yeah. Well, the point is taking away civil liberties, because it's our mm -hmm. constitutional right to protest. Mm -hmm. Well, it's a start of losing your civil liberties to get. It's possible we're going that way. Rogers. And that's why I put martial law up there earlier. Yeah. Are we heading that way? But locally, talking about this would help. Um, here's just an example the new downtown hotel. Is it open? Now, that may be a waste. If our economy is going to collapse in eight years, it's just going to be like the mall an empty thing, or the sports center down there, an empty thing that's useful to have, but somebody paid for it, and it's us. And it's money gone, because we can't get the money back out of it. On the other hand, you know, if we get these massive heat days, you may have to put people in that hotel just to keep them alive. Right. Or you could turn it into a medical, temporary medical hospital. So these are, these are complex issues that need to be fought and talked about. And, you know, People could argue in northern Italy, democracy worked really well 
people would have their coffees and they'd be shouting matches in the coffee thing, arguing these things. But they didn't hate each other. So we could do that. Can we start that culture here? That's what I'm saying. Anyway, basic infrastructure projects. Beef up food and water trips. Do we want to dedicate a couple of large gymnasiums just to storing beans and rice in case there's a major food crop failure and people are starving to starve? That could happen. Heat resilient roads. We, we usually have about four to six years of surplus grain in the summer. And it's down to about a year and a half now. Oh, yeah? Yeah. oh yeah. That we haven't had a decent harvest in 20 years. The news doesn't tell you this because it's the US. So here's the deal. Uh, asphalt softens. It doesn't just melt all of a sudden. It softens. And as you're as the roads get hot, you drive trucks over them, the asphalt does this, and then you begin to break chunks out of it. So once you're breaking axles on these semi-trucks, then they can't drive the road anymore, and they're the ones who bring our food in. So we may want to think about the quality of our roads and preserving them by having fewer drivers. Well, this is something the government could do, uh, a big They're not going to do it if we don't tell them. To, to public transportation. If they don't believe climate change is happening, they're not going to do this. It's a paradise. So let me, let me go outside this a little bit and ask an opinion of everyone here. We, of the 60s, gathered together. We had rock bands at functions that were political. We, we did social, and we recognized economic differences, and we helped each other. And we brought the Vietnam War to an end. You asked, what can we do? We told the government we did not want the war anymore. And it took a lot of activity to do that. How can we use some of that historical positive action in the upcoming environmental climate? Vote for Democrats. So yeah, yeah. see, and that's that's yeah. one way to look at it. But then my question but is, I don't, I don't what Democratic part? What Democrat is going to uh, take us to the red line? Do you think? That, that's what I'm, I'm saying. Again, enough Democrats will take you to the red line. Well, they didn't before. Basically. That's how come the Republicans got in power. The, the middle America white voter that was down on his luck, like the British voter, that now they rebelled against their liberal party. And I'm feeling the same way. Don't put someone in just because he's a D if he's not, if she is not going to do what, what we're here to discuss. You mean the red line? That's right. So I don't know the answer to that. Um, well, just there's a lot know, of people. I'm not bragging, but my degree is in political science. And I see the shape of attitudes and how it affects who we elect, what direction we go in. So what's your prediction? My prediction? It's, it's going to be a damn hard fight. If we stop bickering about ideological differences in many little areas and start making climate the most significant area. So what you're saying is this, right? Yeah, start, I do that, but not uh, one positive thing. I have a new neighbor. She has a daughter. I never talked to her for a year, but I've made myself available in adjacent backyards. I went to the Friday uh, climate thing, and I went to the auditorium, and she, she yelled from, a, from another area, hey, neighbor, I didn't know you thought this way. Yeah, we got to get a chain reaction in that area. Yeah, yeah, well said. It's going to be a slow chain reaction, and it's already set. Look at these burger places that are now serving burgers made out of plants. Mm -hmm. That's a step in the right direction. Anything. I probably would hate the burger, but uh, well, I liked it. You it had, good. You had one? Yes, I like. Yeah. I, I like. Uh, I liked it. Does it taste like hamburger? But we do have a. It tastes like good enough to eat. Uh, yeah. More than a hamburger, yeah. We have a city council, yeah. and I'm always wondering what, where is their role here? Um, yes. What are they doing? How do we enter 
strategize them to work for us, the people, and um, I just um, well, we, always wonder about that. We just, we just had an election, and the city council is now standing a little farther to the left than they used to. And if, if Lamerson loses this um, retry, moves a little farther to the left. So Carol Lucy did moved it to the left. So down here is where the burger is. That's this is our problem. Yeah. So oh. You could stop eating. We could all stop eating tomorrow, and it wouldn't bring us to the red line. So available. So I just wanted to say that it's like. Pulling a few weeds here while a wire wildfire is coming at you. And so you have to bear in mind that it's easy to get preoccupied with some things. Although I know what you're looking for, you're looking for something positive. You want to feel good. Um, it may not be possible to actually feel that way. You may actually have to accept that. We're going to die. Um, no. That actually wasn't what I was going to say. <laughs> Um, because it doesn't work that way. It's what happens is we get old and we see a doctor and we get old and we see more doctors and time goes on and then maybe our knee gives out and then years go by and maybe we have to have a spinal fusion. So it's not as simple as saying we're going to die. I mean, it's There's it's this problem it's associated with, gee, I can't afford rent this month. What am I going to do? Because I had to spend so much money on food. Um, so it's a complicated, messy thing, and you have to try and see things in perspective. So that's the idea of showing a chart like this. I want to say so. For instance, you could. I, I want to ask you. You could I stop want. driving, for instance. I want to. Or you could only ride pool for the rest of your life. You could make that promise to yourself: I'm only going to ride pool, and that would be ten times more effective than eating a burger made out of plants. And. Remember, we only have a few decades, so you kind of want to maximize your thing. So, for instance, instead of trying to change the city council, you might try and build a coalition to get a public bus system started, for instance. Yes, well, our public bus system was on display yesterday, uh, yesterday. Uh, and there was a large amount of people that were curious routes it takes, because right now it's, it's sort of a secret. I don't think we have a public bus system. No, we don't. Yes, we do. That's a private bus system. Well, well, well OK. Well, you, it is, right? It's I, not I a public bus system. I don't know, but it's a mass transit system. It's not, it's, it's not a big one. No, it's just one step above the taxi. So the point is, that may be more important to saving our future than getting a Democrat in office. Although, I wonder if a Democrat could even get a bus system started. They may pass a law at the state level saying, you can't have a bus system. Really? I mean, they're doing weird things like that in this country. Yeah. And in that case, then we're stuck with the forest fire that's coming our way. And remember, in those heat waves, you know, a, a, a firefighter can't be out there. 105, so the fire, forest fire just burns. So this is all really depressing. Go home and take your Prozac. But I take Perioxy. That's what I'm trying to do is to give you actually a perspective of what reality is. So I bought an electric scooter. I'm out there risking my life on this freaking little scooter and these crazy drivers here because it was cheap and it gets amazing gas mileage, rather than driving my car. <coughs> so that isn't something I'd recommend for everyone. That just happened to be one of the things I did to get my carbon footprint. I also, your electric scooter was cheaper than a gasoline scooter? Yeah. Well, that's a good sign. But all these things vary a lot. That question actually can't be asked, because an old gasoline scooter might go for a corner and use maybe a gallon a week. So, and that's 20 pounds of carbon a week. So it's not as simple as just asking the price between the two, price differential. Well, but I know from an architectural standpoint, 
and architects are working their butt off to get residential buildings and commercial buildings to use less energy. But one of the problem is we already have all our buildings. So in order to, you either have to go back and retrofit, or you have to tear down buildings and build new ones, which is a big carbon expense. Well, build a new building. Yeah, but our building codes are becoming more restrictive and more, more energy based in their work. Yeah. Yeah, I know they're doing some things like their solar cells, and I think it's used for pumping water in Prescott Valley. Right yeah. by that big tank yeah. on yeah. Yeah. down the hill. Yeah, and then we had uh, Bill uh, Woodville, Mark Woodville, come to Prescott Indivisible, and he said they've uh, they when they built the uh, waste treatment plant, and he went out here, they actually built it so that they could convert to solar in the future, but they have to be careful because they don't want to say solar to our our government here. So I would say. It strikes me that it's important to meet as many people as you can and see if you can't uh, persuade people because problems are going to be occurring. And if we have good solutions in place. But anyway, that's, that's all I have to say, I think. Thank you so kindly. And thank uh, you for sharing your. Uh, a good way of doing that, Patty, is on Tuesdays when we're on the street corner make friends and make a set of subtle suggestions. It's a slow turning of the boat in the water. I don't think we're going to turn the boat. That means hit the red line. That's what turning the boat means. Well, if we hit the red line, then we will turn the boat. Right, if we hit the red line. But if, like I said, I don't think we will. When we realize it, we will turn. But it's the new guy. If we turn out here, too late. I can't think like that. I was in Denmark like many years ago and I was I remember so well how people were all riding bikes to work. You know, just her hordes of people just all on bikes. Well that may be the best thing for her and I think it would really really be good for business. Because yeah. what would happen if we had a serious like remember the gasoline issues? in the 70s? Yeah. What if we had something like that that was permanent? Yeah. That would shut down our economy, which would be a disaster. But if we had already a public bus line, people would still go to work and still go shopping. So it wouldn't shut down our economy. Well, that's what I have. I have a bicycle repair and I still use bikes. Cool. That's what I need. So, baby steps. It's just kind of scary riding your bike in Oh. <laughs> Walk in this town. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm glad you have that uh, on your minds because I hate to see it go the other way. But I'm coming from Phoenix and San Diego, and I wouldn't ride my bike on those streets. I would ride them here. Uh -huh. You don't have a pacemaker, right, Bill? No. 